two o'clock. So it's time to get started in order to uh, can do everything that is planned for this afternoon, which I know is an exciting program, so we don't want to miss out on any part of it. First of all, welcome to the seminar. Uh, I won't introduce myself, it's very impolite, but you'll hear enough of me later today, so I'm sure you get to know me. But I would like to introduce the rector of this beautiful uh, institute, Professor Eddie Morse, to introduce me then for today. Okay, thank you. This was thank you our first time. And indeed, we'll hear more uh, from Henja. First of all, I would like to welcome uh, all of you here. I think uh, you're here uh, in a large uh, group, and I think with a, a quite nice uh, mixture of uh, people and backgrounds here, uh, which I think uh, will make the afternoon uh, even more exciting. I think one thing is there that uh, combines us all, and uh, that's water. So it's about uh, water today, and uh, we hope uh, to be able, first of all, to let you see a little bit on, on uh, what we're doing here at IIT, especially in collaboration with uh, the Rotary, and secondly, also why we think uh, water is such an important topic. So I hope that that will be uh, the message that uh, you can take home. Um, if something is not clear, or if you have uh, points that you would uh, like to discuss or questions, uh, we do have, uh, I think, a nice coffee break, but also a reception, plus we also give time for questions and answers. So I hope that uh, we will have a nice interactive uh, meeting and sessions here. When uh, I was asked to um, say, give a kick off, so to do uh, the start here, I think that was uh, also uh, something that, that I like uh, to do. I started here a year ago as the rector of uh, this uh, institute. The real nice thing about this institute is that it is uh, an international institute. So it's uh, quite uh, different from most other institutes uh, in the Netherlands, although a lot of institutes in the Netherlands work in an international way. We consider ourselves an international institute based in the Netherlands. And with that, I also uh, would like to welcome a couple of uh, special guests here. And I think we have uh, two uh, interesting people here, and I think uh, well placed. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I, uh, I think uh, what, what I wanted to do is I, I would like to uh, welcome uh, say two uh, foundation trustees, as uh, Julia Phelps and uh, Per Hoy. So thanks very much for being here. Secondly, I think that uh, also with the director-elect, uh, say Jan Lucas here, and he will say a few words later on. I think that's also interesting to have him here in uh, the room. A special uh, welcome I would like uh, to offer actually to uh, Elson Engelenburg. And uh, the reason is a bit that uh, she was here last year as well, so, so we met and we had some quite nice uh, discussions. But uh, what I like about it is that I think she's the first, uh, say, uh, Rotary who offered an, uh, a grant actually from a personal interest in, in water. And I think I can also talk on behalf of her uh, husband. Um, on the Rotary IC program, and I do think that's a, that's a building block for uh, our collaboration, uh, especially for the future. So thanks for being here, uh, Els, again, and, and good to have you on board. And then uh, I would like to say a few words about IG, uh, very briefly, uh, because I can talk uh, for at least a week here, but I will not do that, try to do it in three minutes. Um, IG is, uh, like I said, an international institute. We have a very strong collaboration with UNESCO, and uh, what we do is we provide actually uh, activities on three different uh, fields. Uh, the first field is education, and we'll come back to that in a second. The second one is research, and the third one is what we call institutional strengthening. Uh, the first one, education, uh, what we work uh, with is with uh, MSc programs, short courses, and PhD programs in there. We're aiming at students coming, uh, especially from mid-career positions, from the water sector, from Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So uh, that's why we think it's also a, a nice setting here, because those people come here uh, and they know what their problems are. So they come to IG knowing very well what they want to know, what they want to work at, and that gives them a rather intense atmosphere with uh, a lot of uh, say interesting questions that they ask actually to the lecturers, sometimes making it rather difficult for them, but okay, that's their job. 
But I think that gives a, a, a very nice uh, situation uh, here in the Institute. The second part is the research side, and the research side is uh, also aiming at applied research. So we're doing academic <coughs> supported research, but we're aiming at uh, finding solutions that you can apply in the field, uh, if possible, directly, and if not, we're looking how we can bring it to the next level to put it in the market. And the last part is uh, what we call institutional strengthening, and institutional strengthening is uh, mainly about partnerships, and there we talk about partnerships is lifelong learning with our alumni, and so we try to engage with them through their career. And secondly, uh, we also have institutional partnerships where we work together with uh, university institutes, governments, but also with funding agencies actually to bring together people that have an interest in the water sector and bring it forward. So those are the three main pillars that we bring under the umbrella of capacity development for the water sector, mainly in Africa, Latin America and Asia. Then um, what we uh, like about it is that uh, we try to train uh, people on technical levels. So often people come here with a, a technical problem. So we like to learn them how to solve that. Uh, it's just a bit special because we're not necessarily looking at big uh, say technical solutions, but we're also looking how can you apply uh, technical solutions in a situation, for example, in a refugee camp, or in a situation where you don't have a centralized system in Africa, or in a situation where you can't disperse, uh, say, investments in an easy way and to improve your setup, but you have to do that in an innovative way and enable people to really, uh, say, implement the solutions that we think are needed to bring the quality of life actually to a higher level because that's what it is. <coughs> what we also try to do is uh, we try uh, to um, work with people in, in their lifelong career. So what we're trying to do is besides learning them say the different aspects of the water sector that are uh, needed at the moment, we also look how we can create the new leaders of uh, the water sector in the world. And that can be in different ways. It's, uh, we have uh, quite some alumni that uh, end up being minister of uh, water resources somewhere in different countries in the globe. But we also have alumni that uh, are a leader in a refugee camp and introduce new ways how you can improve uh, life. So it's on different levels. But it's all about, say, being active and uh, being, uh, say, the leader that shows how and where to go. Um, last part that I wanted to say is, and that is a little bit about uh, yourself and, and uh, us as an institute here. Um, like I said, we have a lifelong learning program with our alumni. So we have uh, more than 15,000 uh, alumni uh, over the whole world and we keep uh, close contact with them. So that's a strong network that we have mainly on the water sector. I think the Rotary is another very strong network and I think uh, bringing those two networks together is something that we would like uh, to see how we can work that out. And that's one of the objectives also of uh, this afternoon. So I hope that uh, the speakers that will come up and uh, the sessions that we have planned for you later today will help to get a better idea on what's uh, possible here at IG, but also what has also already been done in this collaboration between the Rotary and IEC. So I wish you all a very pleasant afternoon. And the last thing I wanted to say is, uh, please um, notice that uh, this is being videotaped. And that has to do with the fact that uh, what we try to do is we often try to engage other people that can't be here. So we will also video stream actually the plenary session, only not the breakout session, but the plenary session. It's still good for you to know. I don't know if you wanted to make a remark that you didn't want broadcasts, then please keep that one for the coffee break. <laughs> so thank you all and have a good afternoon. Thanks, uh, Eddie, for uh, the welcome. Um, could I invite the uh, incoming director of Rotary International, Jan Lucas Ketz, to uh, welcome the guest on behalf of Rotary. Thank you, Jan. Uh, thank you, Professor Boas, for your kind words of welcome and uh, your hospitality to host this event in uh, your beautiful <coughs> institute. I will come back to it at the end of my speech where I will have some words about Rotary. Uh, dear Rotary friends, dear friends of Rotary, in the mid-90s, one of my club members, the Argo economist in Merchev, drew our attention to water as a growing global issue. My Rotary Club is permanent, 
And most of you know that the city of Kermarend, less than 20 kilometers north of Amsterdam, is the center of a beautiful area of ponds and wetlands and, and characteristic towns and villages. This area is called Waterland. Waterland. Water is a serious issue there for already a thousand years. Uh, our concern is to keep our feet dry and the wooden poles under our housing wet and to uh, prevent our children from drowning. We have been blessed with a 500-year-old water authority at Hoogheemraadschap van de Uitwateren de Sluizen van Kennerland en West-Friesland. <laughs> and we have certainly the finest drinking water in the world just from the tap. Agroeconomist Piet Mutwerf made us realize that elsewhere, in more and more regions, with ecological deterioration and thereafter food insecurity, followed by demographical shifts, that in these regions access to clean, fresh water was an important and growing issue, influencing peace and conflicts, health, education, and local economies. We discussed the matter in our club and with clubs in our area and district. We found partners also outside Rotary and together we took action. With matching grants of the Rotary Foundation, we organized safe drinking water projects in Indonesia, on Java and Bali, and also in Suriname. And later on, we joined the water working group around nearby Rotary Club Corn. This group formed a long-standing relation based on fellowship and mutual understanding with Rotary Club Nakuru and its Rotary Community Corpses in Kenya, resulting in thousands and thousands of water tanks and also a stream of projects on sanitation, education, microfinance and environmental sustainability. Project 6T with 70 Rotary Clubs and hundreds of individual sponsors. Our club succeeded to bring its water project on a different level of, abstract, of, a, of, a, of abstraction. At this moment, my club sponsored an IHE student, scholar, together with Rotary Club Den Haag des Anden, and with the help of our German partner club, Erfurt Kremer Brücke and Rotary Club Puna in India. Two district foundation chairs supported our scholarship generously, and so did the Rotary Foundation Annual Fund. All these projects we funded in great fellowship. We organized auctions and food festivals, wine selling, biking tours, rallies, golf tournaments, and a yearly educational sponsor walk with school children, a project we successfully exported to our partners in Erfurt. Sure, these 20 years we did much more in our club, but only our track record in water projects already makes me pr a proud Rotarian. It feeds my enthusiasm for our global organization and it makes it easy for me to explain what Rotary is, how Rotary works, and what Rotarians do. We Rotarians are 1.2 million leaders and professionals in our communities. We voluntarily share our passion, time, knowledge, expertise and network to give chances to those who didn't have the opportunities we had. We provide these chances in our communities, but also beyond. We have a frequency in our clubs where we work together in fellowship and in as much vocational diversity as possible, men and women, without limitations concerning gender, color, religion, ideology, national origin or sexual orientation. Our vision, together we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. Let me now come back to the welcome of Professor Eddie Morris. 
I consider the partnership of Rotary IG, of Rotary with IJ Delft, the partnership of Rotary with IJ, a most important asset Dutch Rotarians, clubs and districts offer to Rotary International. Actually, I consider it the most important. I'm looking forward to the involvement of the districts in this partnership in the coming years to guarantee a constant stream of Rotary IHE alumni to the world. I promise you to promote this asset during my years in the board of Rotary International. Today and here in IHE Delft and in Rotterdam, I welcome you all to communicate, to make connections, to share ideas and to take action. I wish you all a pleasant, informative and fruitful session. Thanks, uh, Jan Lucas, for those uh, inspiring words. And I would like to introduce the second uh, Rotary leader to uh, welcome you, and you may wonder why I is the second one. Uh, and I can summarize in very simple words, it's all about money. And our biggest charity, the Rotary Foundation, has been very supportive and so far has funded all the students that we have here. So in that context, I would like to involve Rotary Foundation trustee Per Hoyen to the stage and say a few words of welcome on behalf of the Foundation. Thank you very much. Dear Rector Eddie Moss, dear fellow trustee junior, Director Lekian Lucas, dear fellow Rotarians and guests. Let me start by saying how pleased I am to be here in Delft today at this wonderful institute. The eight hour drive to here yesterday was with three exciting Rotarians in the car. It was clear to me that we all were looking very much forward to be with you and not least to be at the IAG Delft Institute. Now we are here and happy to be with you all. As a trustee of the Rotary Foundation, I heard about the IAG Institute for Water Education many times before. I knew about the special partnership between the Rotary Foundation and IAG. But this partnership started long before I became a trustee, so I had never actually been here to visit the Institute. Therefore, I'm not just here to represent the Rotary Foundation, but I also came here to learn and listen to what others have to say. But one thing I know already is that I am the company, in the company of people who have one thing in common, we all feel very strongly about water, and we are not alone. Many Rotarians worldwide feel the same. Our members have been very active in this field for many decades, so it was not a surprise that water and sanitation became one of the Rotary Foundation's official areas of focus in 2010 when we modernized our grand model. This was also the time when we started the partnership with IAG. So how active are we in the field of water and sanitation? Well, here's a few numbers. In the past three Rotary years, Rotary clubs worldwide implemented more than a thousand large sustainable water and sanitation projects in 83 countries, with a total investment of more than 70 million US dollars. And these numbers only include our so-called global grant projects, not the thousands of smaller projects which Rotary club clubs carry out on their own or with the help of smaller district grants. So let there be no doubt, Rotary really feels strongly about water and sanitation. And here's another fact about the Rotary Foundation. We have a very long tradition of providing graduate scholarships and it's, in its 100 years history, our foundation has provided more than 38,000 scholarships to students from more than 100 countries, and always with the active involvement of Rotary Clubs. Maybe some of you remember our ambassadorial scholarship program, which for many years was the world's largest 
privately funded international scholarship program. So there we have it. A strong commitment to water and sanitation and a long tradition of providing scholarships. I don't think that the logic behind the partnership between Rotary and IAG needs to be explained any further. Last but not least, let me take this opportunity to thank you, Rector Eddy, and everyone else involved for hosting this Rotary event at your institute. And thank you, dear fellow Rotarians and guests, for coming to Delft, some of you from far away, for this workshop. I myself look very much forward to an interesting and informative afternoon. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Per, <coughs> for those uh, inspiring words. I think the next thing on the program is a video uh, that explains a bit of the history and the achievements of the partnership, and I rely on someone else to start it up in the back. Thanks, Laura. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Fellow Rotarians, good afternoon. Olam, Cristiano, Giri, Yara, Karelia, Kudabashi, Lucia, Maria, Said, Stefano, and Sumit, special welcome. You are the batch of students <coughs> that is here right now. I don't think I need to say a lot about the partnership and what has happened. The video did explain it. But I might, would like to start off by saying that we're sitting in this room here with a common purpose and a shared goal. And that is to secure the sustainability of this partnership, both in terms of the funding that we can fund future students, both in terms of the impact that we're going to make with this program on the ground with Rotary Wash projects. And all of you are there in different roles uh, and can play a role in this. And I'd like to sort of share a few thoughts with you later on in the presentation on how this could uh, be getting shaped in the future. So let's see. So first of all, a summary of what you saw in the video. So IHC, I'd only say a lot of words, but it's the largest postgraduate institute of water education. Many alumni, uh, we're proud of our 77 that we have, but you see there are more than 18,000 alumni trained. So it's a big institute, a big player in this game. Both Rotary and, uh, and IHC, of course, have water and sanitation and water and peace as major themes that we want to make an impact on, and therefore this collaboration is a natural fit. It started all in 2011, with three areas where we co collaborated. Uh, the scholarship program, you've seen in the video, and you've seen an example of a couple of uh, alumni uh, speaking there. We also had a dedicated workshop here uh, twice at uh, IAC around the ROC, the Central Asia workshops. This was about uh, uh, the water diplomacy and water governance issues. That is actually going to be followed up with the third lack of cooperation that we have with IHC. And that's a program that not just IHC is involved, but also the University of Costa Rica, the University of Peace, IHC, and the University of Oregon. And that is about water go governance and diplomacy. You will hear much more of it today. On the regular scholarship program, uh, you can see on the map here where our students have come from. Uh, indeed, uh, quite a few from Africa, uh, Latin America, and also a couple of uh, uh, Asian students over here. Uh, in a couple of weeks we see the next batch coming in of 12 students. They have been selected recently and if you look at it, uh, we heard Per saying 60 million of, uh, of investment in scholarships, but well, 2.8 of them has gone to this particular scholarship program at IEG. So a very significant investment of the Rotary Foundation to date. But what do we get for it? And of course, in terms of academic impacts, we can already measure it because we had five batches of students that graduated. And the important bit to look at is the green bit, so the top bit on the graph on the top right. These are the students that uh, graduated with distinction. And I don't want to say anything negative about IHC, you can imagine, but this is well above average of the average IHC student. So Rotary is in a, a position to select the top uh, part the top quality students they get also the uh, guidance and support while they're here in the Netherlands and they have the Rotary network in the country when they go back to it and, and all of these factors together makes a very strong partnership to uh, develop the, the competences that, uh, that we need in our water projects a few words on the water and peace project I mentioned it a few seconds ago um, but that's indeed a joint program between the three universities and the objective is to provide critical analysis skills, as is nicely worded, 
uh, of water security within the broader context of peace and stability. Nice words, but this program really uh, puts their, uh, the, the nuts and bolts in place for that. So far we had two students, they were two, uh, Amer of an American student and a German student. <coughs> This year we will see, or well actually they have started, they're right now in Costa Rica, we will have seven students from the area that we had these two workshops in Central Asia around the, uh, the ROC. Uh, you will see them later in the year coming here in Delft. You can see on the bottom the countries they are, are coming from. Then you saw in the video an example of Bolivia, it was mentioned, the eco-sanitation projects. That was actually a, a project started up by three alumni, uh, two from Bolivia, Afnan and Mariel, you saw Mariel in the video and Scott Taggart, you saw also in the video uh, from Canada. And they took the initiative to start up a project in, in uh, the rural area in West Bolivia. They got the uh, Rotary Club of uh, La Paz uh, Sopocachi uh, interested, and together with uh, Dutch clubs, German clubs, and Canadian districts and clubs, uh, we got a global grant uh, sorted the, to actually fund the implementation of this. Uh, of course, the presentation will be shared afterwards with you. If you uh, click on the QR code at home, you will get more information on the, uh, the project. There's more to be found uh, on the program. We have a Facebook page that's currently being followed by 4,500 uh, followers. Uh, many Rotarians, but also many people outside Rotary. So it's a very powerful way to promote the good work that we're doing in this field and also to attract others to be in support of this program. Then there is a Rotary blog or blog, whatever you pronounce it, uh, where some of the stories of the individual students are, are being uh, published. Also worth uh, looking into. Now, this is still a little bit looking back, what have we achieved, and, and so on. Um, but of course, uh, how can you become involved? And if you look at uh, the local level, or in, in the district level, uh, of course, uh, you can be uh, involved in the funding side of it, and uh, we will have some more discussion around it in the, uh, in the interactive workshops. Um, but you also, it applies particularly for the Dutch Rotarians who live in, in the, the neighborhood of Delft, or say the, this district, uh, become a host counselor. Because part of the success of the program was that every student had an individual Rotarian who took care of the student and sorted some of the issues. And some of the issues were fairly mundane, but we also got to the stage of getting one out of a Brazilian jail. So, so it's, it's quite varied in what the role of a host counselor uh, can be. I'm coordinating that on this end, and I'm, I'm often asked, what does it mean to be a host counselor? And I quite honestly have to say, it is exciting, you know, not precisely what can happen, but you don't know, uh, I can't give you a firm answer. Um, importantly, on the funding, uh, each student, the total cost of an 18 months program is 50,000. Uh, that includes accommodation, that includes a travel here, all the education fees, so that's the all-in cost of a student in the Netherlands. Um, we, the students you saw on the world map, they were funded by a package grant, and in that system, uh, the Rotary Foundation fully funded it, so the 2.8 million that you saw was fully funded by the Rotary Foundation, with a couple of global grant students on top, but the majority was coming from the package grant. However, that uh, package grant was stopped in 2014, um, but the Rotary Foundation considered, the, of the trustees of the Rotary Foundation considered this program so successful that they have uh, granted an extension of, uh, twice an extension of two years. So in total we've been running on a package grant type funding model uh, for seven years. And the last extension there was also a significant contribution from all seven Dutch Rotary Clubs here. So, so the program gets traction. Um, but we still at the, the beginning stage to discuss how do we make it really sustainable. And that's what's today about, and that's why we, we need to have these discussions. And of course, global grants can have many funding sources. It could be local clubs, it could be districts with a district designated fund, it could be private uh, donations, or it could be external parties that support us. And I think we need to explore all of those options in order to come to a sustainable setup. I think that's my key message that I would like to land with you. Uh, and of course, I'm, I'm available in the rest of the day for, for further clarification or, or anything. And so are some of the other Dutch Rotarians who are here and who are heavily involved, in particular Wim Goedendorp and Bas Hendrikse. They know everything about it as well. So please fire some questions to them as well. Um, but with, on that note, I think I would like to, uh, to conclude my talk. And I would actually like to go in a bit more uh, uh, depth in terms of the technical issues and the content what I see delivered. And for the first bit, I would like to invite Professor Damir Badjanovic. I hope I say it right, Damir. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. That's, uh, that's at least <laughs> good to hear. 
Uh, and he will elaborate on what IHG does in terms of water and sanitation. So the minute the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here and uh, uh, honored to share some news uh, from the area of WASH, so Water Supply and Sanitation at UNESCO IG. In the last decade have, here, we witnessed a major developments in a positive way in this field. And I'd like to use the first five minutes of my presentation about a little bit about self-marketing and uh, basically update of these developments. And then next 10 minutes will be about some ideas that we have. How can we uh, make you being more involved, even more involved in our activities? And not only uh, during the time that our students spend here uh, at uh, EIIG Delft, but also with our partners, but also after, so in their more professional or academic careers after they get degrees here. So what have been new here at this institute? Now uh, I can share the news that we uh, pay lots of attention in developing uh, top class uh, materials, so textbooks and uh, other books in this area. Some of our books are the, the, the best sellers in the, at the global level. Uh, some of them are downloaded more than 50,000 times from different media. And many of them are used in uh, sanitation programs in different universities globally. Um, we were also translating these books into many languages, uh, Spanish, uh, Hindi, Tamil, Marathi, Korean, Chinese, Arabic, French, and so on. We have been very active in developing ma a major uh, number of online courses, so to reach more people than they can, they, they can reach only with the face-to-face -face education. Only next year, we will develop a batch of, uh, 12, of 12 new online courses, and by that, we'll have a program of about 20 online courses uh, available for our students worldwide. And also, not only students, but also other professionals. We develop a professional diploma program in the meantime, and we have, at the, at the moment, uh, three programs related to WASH. One is water supply engineering specialization, one is sanitary engineering specialization, and I'm proud to announce a new program on non sewer sanitation, which is uh, supported by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We are expanding our labs very dramatically. You will, some of you will see the labs in the afternoon. We have uh, experimentation labs, we have analytical labs, and we are building at this moment a fecal sludge and septic sludge lab for experimentation and analysis of, uh, of these materials. This is the only lab on the northern hemisphere of this type and only one of the six labs in the world of that type. Um, we are expanding dramatically our partnerships with the different universities. At this moment, we are planning to transfer our programs from Delft and to reach more students globally. We are planning to transfer our sanitation program to 30 universities in the world and that will form uh, something that we call Global Sanitation uh, Graduate School. Next to that, we also established last year something called Global Sanitation Learning Alliance, where we put all educational materials from us and from our partners, uh, which are open access, so that all, uh, all sanitation experts in the world can access these materials free of charge. Further on, we are happy to announce that a couple of years ago, we were um, um, a focal point of establishment of the new journal. That's the only journal specifically made for publications in, uh, uh, from developing countries. That's called Journal of Water Hygiene and uh, uh, Sanitation for Development. And we are really um, trying to become a focal point, the leader, the global leader in sanitation in the world. Um, innovation is in the center of our interest. So it's not only education, but also research, because each MSc thesis has a research part. And we are proud that we also collected um, for our 60th anniversary 60 innovations of UNESCO IG. And you will see that most of these innovations are not technological only, but also social and educational of educational nature. So this was a bit uh, the first part. 
<laughs> an update. And with that, uh, I would like to, to discuss with you, or at least put some ideas in front, how can we work better together? Uh, I'm quite impressed with what I've heard so far, and uh, I thank you for all your contributions so far. Uh, you are very active in getting these scholarships and supporting our students during the, the program here, and that's really a fantastic example. Um, where I would like to see a bit more uh, um, involvement and, and, and improvement is that we together defined their thesis, their research work that they will do here. Most of their thesis work is done abroad. So we would like really that at early stage we define this thesis at the beginning as a part of your project probably, and that we do it at early stage so that we can prepare very well for that research period, that we can do it together and help students together with our partners, and then also follow up after the thesis period is finished. And maybe that's only part of the project that we can cover in the scholarship, but then maybe the second part of the involvement will be continuation of the work on the same project using the results from the obtained from the scholarship period. So there I think there is a, a space for improvement and we, we can do that. Some other ideas, uh, when, you, when you see that we have now 77 students and the, the ambition is to double it at least in the coming future, um, we would like to manage these st the students, the community, better. We would like to keep them better together, that uh, they have a common interest. And um, we have already done it with, with some part of our alumni community, especially in, in the wash and sanitation sector. And we would like to replicate this, these ideas. So um, maybe uh, some kind of uh, website can be developed that can be attached to the, to the Rotary website. And in that website, we could, we could show all our students, we could, we could uh, uh, present their interest, uh, results of their work. So all their theses can be presented there, small videos, and, and so on and so on. And if you need, for example, someone to, to, to help you in project in some country, you can go to that website, this kind of HR website, resource website, where you can get information and directly contact the student without going through IG system. So um, I wanted to not only to talk, but also to show you some, some advances there. And I prepared with my team a small uh, demo of a possibility that can um, um, facilitate this, this uh, concept. So, I think most of you recognize the right side, that the picture that's from your website, from Rotary website, the scholarship side. And uh, uh, this uh, Global Sanitation Learning Alliance, that, that, that is a framework that we already have. And that framework uh, 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 is, a, is, is an umbrella which uh, unites all educational institutes related to sanitation who are ready to, to share their programs and their materials. For example, this, this website could look like this. I hope it, it works here as well. And I move to alumni community. And we could have here our alumni community. We put some of the students here. So here are our students, so it's a little bit slow website, maybe because it's a demo. And then here you see some of our, of, of our students. So you can, you can have a search engine here where you can, I'm still missing some parts of that, but you can select if you want expertise with the research, design, teaching, and so on. The website will automatically look for people with these skills and will, I'm sorry, this, this browser is not working very well here as on my laptop. And then uh, basically you will get to, to, to a certain selection of students with certain skills. And if you would um, click, I think this is one of our students, yes, Maria. Then you will get the basic information about that student. You will get a CV on, at some, uh, uh, in some form. Uh, contact details, the, the way how the, the student entered into that website, and student can write a small story about her or his work, and you can read about that story. Now this is a, just an, a, the real example, and um, at the end you, you find a small quote and other details, and details of, of uh, other stories and so on. In the project that was funded by the Gates Foundation, we have this uh, already in place for, uh, for more than, than 500 students, and it works very well. So I would like to take that platform and maybe to expand it on, on the Rotary um, level. 
Then, uh, uh, the, what is important is valorization of our efforts. So to see what really happened with the money and with the, with the all knowledge that we put into these uh, people and with the knowledge that they accumulated and how they use this knowledge after they leave uh, IG. So we can have a valorization uh, a program uh, which can also have some fun there to support small startup projects and their ideas after they leave IG to implement in the real, in the real world. And they can always um, uh, report that back to us and we can put it in as, as small stories, small videos, put it on this website and share it with all our community and also people outside of the Rotary. Um, we can also think more about how can we disseminate uh, the, 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 the strategy of uh, Rotary in, in area of WASH and how can we use our students. Um, we can also design some side activities of students while they are in Delft, which are more related to entrepreneurship uh, side. Here they learn lots about the theory and the practice, but how they can turn it into a business, that's not so much covered in our program. So I would like to have maybe the idea that they have some courses next to the cor regular courses to develop entrepreneurship skills and to have that kind of package. So when they go back, they can you know, be much more efficient in there, uh, in building up their own companies and making their own, their own money and being their own boss. I think like that, they have even uh, higher possibilities to develop their own ideas and to, to implement their own ideas without being uh, maybe um, in, in certain frameworks that might not develop their ideas from the beginning. So to be more free in their achievements. And the last part that uh, we could really look at is the innovation part. Innovation part is extremely important. The, it's not only the theoretical knowledge that students will have here, but it's most, mostly also a practical knowledge. And this practical knowledge is really important for sustainability, so that they can really continue working on their ideas that they have developed here, that all these good outputs that they get from the thesis are not lost and just left on the table or on a small local project, but also taken on into the future life, to go into patenting, maybe uh, making a, a more impact, impact with the results of this program. So I would also propose to have a kind of rotary wash incubator. Uh, something like that is happening here at, at Tel Delft. There is an incubator called Yes Delft, in which uh, uh, young uh, researchers have a chance to, de to develop their ideas with subsidies from, from the Dutch government. Um, we could also maybe think in that direction to, to uh, support innovative side of our, of our work, so that it's not a only practical work, but also a more, uh, uh, more sustainable work, which can generate some income for, 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 uh, for the people who develop that, but also to have more, more impact on the ground. Just for inspiration, uh, we are running a, a large program financed by Gates Foundation, in total around $25 million. And uh, we prepared uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, dissemination material that uh, Bill Gates himself had the opportunity to read, where we summarized where this, the money has been spent. So something like that, or similar things, we can also do with, with Rotary Foundation and do such a publication which will raise the, the, the image of, and uh, even further, in image of our, of our efforts and, and have some more structured uh, output that can be shared globally. So I have here uh, quite some feed for thoughts for our workshop. And there, where I would, this is the point where I would stop. My question is to you, what next? Yeah, that's the, the point then. So what, <laughs> what, what next and how, how far our ambition go? That's my uh, question for the workshop to think about. Thank you. I'm not hiding that. So really, I don't think there can be uh, any doubts with any of you that the two sessions that Amir is going to lead with a couple of our students after the plenary sessions will be boring. I don't think it will be totally the opposite. Uh, I must say we had some discussion earlier on on the alumni network and try to set and build kind of a knowledge management base. I'm really excited about it because I see it as the next logical step 
um, on the maturity journey that we're on with this partnership. We started by improving the way we selected our students, we started by improving getting the Rotary connection better, and now we need to continue improving with making the real impact by making connectivity with the alumni with the Rotary project. So I think it's a natural, logical step, and it, and it deserves uh, uh, some considerable thought in my view. So with that, I would like to move to the next speaker. Uh, and I would like to invite uh, Zaki Schuber, who is uh, leading the uh, Water the Governance and Diplomacy. I would say Water and Peace, but that's doing it justice, Zaki, I think. So Water Governance and Diplomacy, and she will address the other leg of our cooperation. There you go, Zaki. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Zaki Schuber. I realize now that I forgot to put my title. I'm a lecturer in law and water diplomacy, so I'm actually a lawyer. Uh, by training, and I now focus on water legislation and conflict resolution as well. I'm very pleased to be here, I have to say, because my involvement with Rotary dates from the time I started at Aichi. The first week I was here, the then president of Rotary International visited Aichi, and I was asked to come in and, and sit um, and talk about the peace element um, of water and peace. And so ever since I have uh, conducted a number of activities that Henk Jaap has very uh, kindly already mentioned, um, and so um, I'm very pleased to see so many of you here uh, to, to hear about the work that IHE is doing uh, both in, uh, in uh, sanitation but also in, in water and peace. So I call this uh, presentation Water and Peace. We don't actually talk about water and peace ourselves, but I know that peace um, is important for um, Rotary, and I went to, uh, to your website to have a look at uh, what you say about peace. Um, and I thought that the, uh, the words here, and particularly the, the end of the paragraph, are very telling um, and clearly connect efforts uh, to, to maintain peace, to prevent uh, conflict, to water, water being, of course, a uh, natural resource. And I particularly liked, I have to say, this waging peace. Um, I like that a lot, and so I think I'll be uh, adopting it as well as, uh, as one of my mottos. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about water diplomacy, water governance as well. Um, it's a, a difficult task, I have to say, because we can't really demonstrate what it looks like. Um, it's, it's quite intangible, uh, but hopefully I can, I can give you a flavor of, of what we're doing. But before I do that, I want to give you a bit of background um, and maybe talk about some of the, uh, the current challenges and, and future challenges also in, in the water sector. And to do that, to start off, I've, uh, I was online um, and I picked a few titles that, uh, and headings that perhaps you've also come across um, in the past years and months as well. Um, and I think what's, what's interesting here is that what we see with all these, uh, all these uh, uh, quite alarmist, in some cases, um, headings, um, is that we've taken water for granted for, for a long time, but we have come to an age where that's no longer possible. We really experience, and I say this because I've, I've been to a number of countries this year and I've heard the same story, which is we are shifting from a world of water abundance or a water-rich world um, to a world where water is becoming scarcer and scarcer. And so in that sense, we really need to think about how we're managing the resource and make sure that we do that carefully so that we really make sure that all living beings, whether human or animal, and the environment have sufficient water for their survival. And so these, these are the kinds of, of uh, headings you can see in the, in the news at the moment. I do want to say also that it's something that we're experiencing throughout the planet. So you'll see that I've taken uh, examples from, uh, from Sweden, uh, the drought there that's had an impact uh, also on, on farming. Uh, there's been a drought here, there's been a drought throughout Europe. There were disputes in the United Kingdom between farmers and the government. So I really want to show that, you know, when we think about water disputes and water scarcity, it's not just maybe in some parts of the world uh, where we think, you know, uh, there are hot spots and people are fighting over water, but it's really happening everywhere. And so I think the efforts that we're putting into, into education here at IG are really for, for everyone um, uh, around the world. And so what I've shown here is what the press has picked up on. 
Um, and here I have another example from the, the World Economic Forum. Uh, for the past four years, it's picked uh, water crises as one of the top risks uh, for the next five to, to ten years. Um, so there really is a, a general um, perception that water is an issue that needs to be brought to the forefront. I haven't included the pictures of the Security Council. Um, water scarcity and, and conflicts around water are also a topic that's being discussed at the highest level of international organizations. So slowly we see a, 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 an acknowledgement by the international community of the, of the importance um, of water and the importance of managing the water because although in some cases the scarcity is a volumetric scarcity there isn't actually enough water for everyone um, it's not always just about the the volume of water it's often about how the water is being distributed to different users now i want to um, talk a little bit about why we're facing these uh, these uh, these challenges so I think some of the headings would have given you a pointer or some indications of what the causes are, but perhaps you also have some ideas as to why suddenly water seems to be the scarce resource. So I'm opening the floor to you. A few more people living on this planet. Yeah, that's one of the, uh, the reasons that's often cited. Anything else? Global warming. Global warming, climate change, yes. Conflicts. So general conflicts are putting more pressure. War, yes, I mean, water becomes suddenly an issue when, uh, when there is a conflict and, and bringing water to, uh, um, to populations affected by conflict. We're getting richer. Sorry? We're getting richer. We're getting richer, yeah, economic development. And you know what impact that has? Yeah, we need more, more meat. We need more, more food, but we need more, more meat. And it, bottles of water where we have good take water yes yeah we use uh we use a uh, bottle of water instead of drinking water from the, the tap i was actually in sweden recently and in a restaurant they charged us for tap water we were very upset yeah. um so yes uh climate change population growth uh economic development are certainly some of the some of the reasons why uh, there's more pressure on water and i have to say the pressure is is not just on water also it's on land uh and it's on other uh, resources as well uh, but certainly these are driving the the need for, for more water um and there are two sectors, I haven't mentioned this on my slide, but there are two sectors that are particularly affected by that. I mean, one is agriculture and the other one is... Health. No? Industrial development. Industrial development, but what does industrial development require? Cooling water. Energy. Cooling water, energy, yes. Yeah. So energy and, and water, and maybe some of you have heard of the, of the nexus, the water food yeah. uh, energy nexus. And uh, the increasing pressure on water is putting pressure, well, affecting both the agricultural and energy sector. So, so the impact is we have increased pressure on the, the resource, and that increased pressure means there's increased competition over the resource. And of course, increased competition means that there's potential for, for conflict. Now, it's not all a, a, a gloom and a doom story. There, there is a hope, and, and I want to say that uh, probably since the dawn of civilization, we have put in place uh, rules and regulations to prevent or, or to mitigate conflict. Um, and I'm going to focus on, on two tools, uh, diplomacy and, and governance here, because those are topics that we cover here at, uh, at IOT. And so, so I'm going to start with, uh, with diplomacy, and, and maybe some of you have heard about water diplomacy or, or hydro diplomacy. It's a, a theme that's uh, become quite popular in the, in the past decade. It's something that's, I have to say, a little bit of a, a buzzword, but it's attracting a lot of attention. Um, and the reason for that is there are approximately 310 international water courses and approximately 600 transboundary aquifers. So we have both surface water and groundwater that crosses borders and is shared by more than one, by two or more countries. 
And of course, when you have political borders between countries, it means that you have to engage in certain processes in order to interact and engage with other countries. And so that's where diplomacy has a, a role to play and, and water diplomacy. And it's very much about the, the tools um, that are being applied and the actions that are being taken <coughs> at different levels and within different tracks, diplomacy tracks, involving different actors um, in order to try and prevent or resolve conflicts or facilitate cooperation over shared water resources uh, between states. And it's both bringing states to talk about water and how to manage jointly the water that they share, but it's also um, about using diplomacy um, in water to try and, and foster a broader cooperation between states as well. So it's two sides of the same coin, but of course in the first instance the focus is uh, on water. And just to give you a few examples of, of transboundaries, of hotspots, I'm sure many of you have heard about the, uh, the Grand Renaissance Dam in, uh, that's being built in Ethiopia, on the border between Ethiopia and Sudan, um, on the eastern Nile, and the impact that that's having on the, the relation between Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia. Things are, are, are moving in the right direction now, I think. There, there's been a, a continued dialogue between the three countries, and. Some of the major obstacles have been overcome, but there isn't yet an agreement as to how the dam is going to be filled and, and the impact that, that will have on both Sudan and, and Egypt. But these are the kinds of problems that we see happening, that we hear about. Uh, there are many more transboundary uh, water courses. Not all of them receive the same attention, but all of them require joint management by states. And so the support of water diplomacy to help uh, to facilitate uh, the dialogues in order to, to try and reach an agreement that then solidifies the, um, uh, the way in which the, the states will be um, dealing with the, the water um, resource. Governance, and I have to say here, I, I belong to the, the water governance uh, chair group. Um, so I'm very happy that governance is also uh, playing a, a role here. It's, uh, it has, there are many definitions. I've picked one from the, the Global Water Partnership. Um, it's not the only one, there are many others. But it's really, water governance is important because it's about the gains of the rules. So basically, who's deciding who gets how much water, when, how, or why, or why not? And so that's a really important element of how water is being distributed to the different water users. Who's getting priority? Is priority going to drinking water, to cities that need drinking water, or is it going to farmers that need the water for agricultural purposes? And what are the bases for those decisions? Who's making the policies? Why are they making the, these policies? What interests do they represent? What interests are not represented? Um, around the, the uh, decision-making table and so forth. And so it's, I said earlier when I started that this is an intangible aspect of water resources management, so it's actually very difficult to quantify or to show, you know, uh, if we're thinking about diplomacy, how many disputes you've avoided, uh, because you, you simply can't quantify that, um, because if the dispute hasn't happened, then you don't count it as a dispute. But it's, so it's really all these invis invisible threads that have an impact ultimately on the uh, um, on, on availability of water for, for different users. So, so these really for me are, are the challenges and perhaps those are also challenges that you've been facing in the projects that you've been involved in and, and I hope that in the workshops we'll have an opportunity to hear about your experience of, of governance issues. So, uh, the, the, the rules or, or the, the, the regulation around the way in which uh, uh, new infrastructure is being brought somewhere and, and uh, uh, ensuring also that uh, governance is, is linked to, uh, to sustainability also, making sure that once a project is there, uh, that there, are, there is sort of an agreement, a framework that helps the, uh, the project to, to continue. And so, as I said, it's, it's intangible. Um, and it's difficult to, to demonstrate the impact of, of governance on the, on the ground, but it remains, I think, very important. And that's why it's one of the disciplines that is here at IHE. And I'm sure you'll all, all agree with me that um, water resources management requires uh, many disciplines. So it's really a, a multidisciplinary uh, um, uh, sector. 
and, and governance, social sciences and governance are, are a key element. So we have the technical know-how, but we also have that uh, non-technical, that soft uh, or fuzzy, as some people say, uh, fuzzy element of water resources management, um, which is really, really important. And here we, we look at governance also from an academic perspective. So, you know, looking at processes from a critical perspective, understanding them, pointing out the gaps, um, trying to, to see where power lies, because uh, governance is also very much about identifying power and the power um, uh, asymmetries between the different users, meaning that some users may get less water because they are less powerful uh, for different reasons than, than others. And so in, in the work that I do and that my colleagues do, uh, we look at these, uh, these processes to try and understand them. But in the work that I do, we also give our students tools and skills and competences to address uh, conflicts and to, to engage uh, from an interpersonal perspective also when a conflict is about to, uh, to arise. Um, and so um, I'll, I'll talk to you in a minute about the, the different courses that we have. But some of the key courses um, in conflict management uh, and, and in governance are also uh, about the, the critical thinking and about the practical uh, engagements um, as well. So what do we do in terms of uh, diplomacy and governance at, uh, at IHC? In terms of education and our master programs, we have a master program in water governance and management. Um, and that's a general program within which the students can choose to do um, water conflict management modules. Um, so two, three week courses that focus on conflict management from a theoretical and from a practical perspective. Um, and together with that, they also study water governance, um, water law and, and other topics that are useful um, to understand the, the processes I was talking about. And uh, Henkiap already mentioned uh, a joint program, it's called Water Cooperation and Diplomacy, Very good. Um, and we, we run it with the University for Peace in Costa Rica and with Oregon State University in the United States. We have a, a long-standing relationship with uh, OSU, um, and we um, got to know the University for Peace and appreciate the work that they do in training their students in broad conflict and peace studies. And so we, we thought that bringing the expertise of UPs our expertise in water and conflict management and the expertise of Oregon State University in conflict management as well, bringing all of that under one umbrella was a very powerful way of training the next generation um, of water leaders, um, of water professionals that know how to deal with conflicts or know um, how to think about preventing or mitigating uh, potential conflicts. And um, as, has been, as has been said already, we, we're very privileged and grateful to Rotary for the support that our students have received um, to, to participate in this course. Um, I don't have the exact figure of, of the cost of the course, but it's a bit more than um, staying in Delft for, for 18 months. The course is actually 17 months. And the students start in Costa Rica, then come to IHC, and then go to the United States. It's a 17 month uh, program. But we know that it's uh, it's, it's a unique program, no one else offers anything like that, and we're very proud of it and very happy that we have Rotary Scholars on the, the program. Of course, we also do research, and so our students um, focus uh, their thesis on topics that are related to governance um, or conflict as well. Um, and I think perhaps that's also uh, an area where, where there might be uh, some opportunities uh, for us to, to work with uh, Rotary uh, clubs. And we have research projects also. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to mention all the governance projects because there are many. I'm just focusing on the ones that are more related to, to water diplomacy, my uh, area. Uh, but one of our colleagues is leading a, a very interesting project on the role of media uh, and science in, uh, and communication in, in water diplomacy, uh, focusing first on the Eastern Nile, uh, but then scaling it up to other basins. So that's something uh, where we are also developing uh, more activities. I have to say that until fairly recently, uh, our capacity was relatively limited because I was the main uh, water diplomacy person, but our group has grown significantly over the past year, and so now we, uh, we're developing a, a broader strategy for, for water cooperation and diplomacy at the Institute. And one of our, our 
key activities also because there is a need to train water professionals uh, who are already doing the work and need a few extra tools, uh, some expertise, some skills to do their work bet better. And so we do a lot of institutional strengthening or um, capacity building. I'm not sure that's the right terminology, I always get a bit confused. But anyway, it's training for, for professionals. And here, again, one of the ways in which I've been involved uh, with Rotary is um, preparing and, and conduct, conducting two workshops on preventive diplomacy for transboundary water management uh, with a focus on uh, Central Asia, which were both done with the support of, of Rotary, uh, with participants from Central Asia who came for a two-week workshop and a one-week workshop here to, to learn about uh, transboundary water management not in their region, but generally, um, and to get some competences and, and learn some skills, and not just focus on learning those skills, but on um, getting to know each other, um, and, and working with professionals from other countries. And the idea is that we wanted to create a sort of informal network between these participants, so that when they went back to their countries, they would have an opportunity or they would know who to contact if they wanted to talk, say, to someone in Tajikistan, they would have a contact person because they had spent two weeks uh, with, uh, with them here in, in Delft. Um, and the idea is that these people are going to gradually uh, rise to the ranks, and I'm pleased to say that one of them has just become his country's ambassador to uh, Austria. Um, so I'm very pleased to see that, you know, um, uh, participants who benefited from a, a Rotary supported um, workshop are really um, going to bring that knowledge to the work they're doing and, and will have an impact. So I was talking about the fact that it's intangible. I want to say also that education takes a bit of time. We're educating the, the younger generation now, but I think it's very important to educate today the experts um, of tomorrow. And so we're very pleased that we're, we're doing these kinds of activities. Um, including with the, the support of, uh, of Rotary. Now to end, and, and perhaps to give you some, uh, some food for thought um, for our workshops, um, in terms of opportunities for, for expanding uh, joint activities, I think the fellowships that have been provided, and I should say here that the existing program that's been here since 2011 has supported also students who've done the water conflict management uh, track in the water governance uh, program that I mentioned earlier. Um, so Rotary has also uh, been supporting students who don't necessarily engage with transboundary or international conflicts, but also local conflicts. Um, and, and of course, the, the fellowships for our, our water cooperation and diplomacy uh, scholars um, is uh, a great benefit. I think it would be very interesting also um, perhaps to link some of the theses of our students, our Rotary-supported students, um, to work that's being done in their home countries. And um, you'll hear from one of them in, in a workshop that I'll be conducting. Uh, she's from Nicaragua, and we already know that when uh, her thesis work uh, will focus on Nicaragua and work uh, related to uh, Rotary activities there. And finally, IHG has an enormous network um, of alumni um, and we want to strengthen our Water and Peace alumni uh, network and also uh, put that network um, at the disposal of, of Rotary and, and have uh, an exchange or, or make available our own Water and Peace water cooperation and diplomacy experts to uh, the Rotary uh, family as well. And so uh, that would be another way, perhaps, also of coming closer and, and making the expertise that we have here in-house and that we have developed through uh, our students available to um, all of you. Now I'm going to stop here. I think I went over my 15 minutes. Um, but I'm happy to answer any additional questions that you may have during the workshops, or if you'd like to send me an email, I'm happy to respond to you as well. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Saki, and uh, I think uh, uh, 
Uh, Saki took a, a couple of minutes longer, but uh, we anticipated on uh, on that. And uh, we <laughs> still have uh, some minutes actually uh, free for some uh, general questions uh, before we pass on to uh, to the next part of the afternoon. And um, as I said, we were taping this. We, we, we have a, a, a mic in here. It's not so hard, so, so we can throw it to you. <laughs> I'm not sure if I manage on the, the last row, but maybe you can do it in, in two halves. <laughs> they can just talk. Excellent. Okay. Uh, my name is Gilad Bichandani. I'm from uh, Rotary District 1620 from Belgium. Uh, I've been working on water projects all over the world for the last 15 years. And I'm sure we've saved a lot of lives, but one needs to understand that when one saves a life, one becomes ipso facto responsible for that life. Now, the thing is that I think in all these discussions, and I'm not just talking about SDG 6, but all of the SDGs, we seem to be missing a very uh, important focal point. In 1798, the start of the Industrial Revolution, we had a little less than one billion people on this planet. Uh, today, we are crossing seven billion. Uh, we know that this planet can take 20 billion. But that's it. And that's if we all learn to shoot insects and are vegetarian. We have made enormous strides in providing water and improving the life standards of millions of people all over the world. But we know today that in 2030, we are going to be faced with 700 million water refugees. Are we going to have any water available or peace? Neither of them seems to be very achievable or attainable. Why is there not more emphasis put? Nowhere in the 17 SDGs is there any emphasis put on birth control or population control. I would think that if one is faced with such an, uh, uh, a problem with such enormous pro uh, proportions, that one would focus, first of all, on limiting or containing the problem. And there is no emphasis given on that whatsoever. That's my question. <laughs> but uh, the statement is appreciated, and I think that uh, also, uh, I think it was called out, uh, I think, from uh, somebody else as one of the first statements that uh, the increase in population is one of the, the major concerns. Uh, how and what to do about it, I think it's a little bit out of the scope, at least, of uh, IG Delft. <laughs> so I, I, I apologize uh, for that part. Uh, something in the water. Yeah, I think uh, it's an important issue to uh, take into account, and I think that's the same thing with climate change. And there are two things there. One is mitigation, and one is what they sometimes call adaptation. Uh, the mitigation part is uh, strongly related to the energy uh, sector, and that's about uh, reducing emissions and making sure that the concentrations is uh, coming at the level that uh, we think is sustainable. But the adaptation part is taking into account that uh, even if you start having a program there now, it will take some time before that will be in operation, and you should adjust for that. I think maybe with uh, increasing population density, we should have a, a similar approach. I do think that there are programs on uh, trying to reduce the population increase. I think if you look over the world, there, there's also a different, uh, um, actually, um, signs, different trends. And what uh, you see in Asia for a large part is actually that uh, by uh, assuring that there is an improved quality of life and even the urbanization trend is uh, adding to that as well, that you see a reduce actually in population growth. Um, what we see now is that uh, especially Africa is, is uh, one of the continents where 
the population growth uh, is expected to be highest. So I think what we should try to also contribute, uh, besides, of course, inform people about uh, the, uh, the impact it may have if you have a population intensity, is that we should assure that there is an improvement in quality of life, because that seems to be a very important driver in reducing population growth. And so I think it's, it's a, not, not that easy to answer statement, like, like I said, but it's something that people should have in the back of their mind, and I think it's also good to discuss it, but maybe this is not the right platform to do that. So again, appreciate it, but maybe try to focus on, on the water side, which is where we can contribute, and I do think that by improving the quality of life, we can indirectly contribute to your statement. Can uh, yeah maybe when I say you on the basement, those that are also more I have a little short. Keep it closer to your mouth. Sorry, the microphone. So yes, I have a a bit shorter question. But on the short term, it's I think more important than the last subject. In the challenges of the sure I missed the biggest one on the short term. How can we keep this subject, governance and diplomacy, out of the hands of Donald Trump? Are you stopped? Interesting question again. <laughs> Maybe we should stop uh, having tweets. <laughs> But uh, I, I suggest, uh, I, I, I like the, the statement a bit, but uh, I suggest to have it for the reception because I think you can have a very nice discussion about that. And I wouldn't mind talking to you about that later on. Please. Eddie. Yes. Um, the question of accessing your resources in Rwanda. Yeah. This is something we discussed with you and even your predecessor. Because we recognize there is a real talent out there who's worked with, oh sorry, I should have introduced myself. Yeah. Ron Denham, uh, Chair Emeritus of WASRAC, the Water and Sanitation Rotarian Action Group. Um, we recognize the opportunity, but we've had difficulty linking up, and I was wondering if your processes and procedures will make it easier for us to identify alumni in various countries who would be an additional resource for the Rotarians in that country working on water, sanitation, or hygiene. Now, I, I, I think there, uh, there are two things there. One is that I think what Damir showed is an example or I think how we can overcome maybe some of the problems that we have uh, seen until now to bring them together. Of course, we have to be a little bit careful with this, uh, the, the, the privacy laws that are in place at the moment. But yes. I do think that uh, with what, what uh, Damir was proposing, so that's actually creating a sort of a professional a group or a community, and then it becomes a bit easier to also share uh, this, this information with one another. So I, I think it's possible, and I think that uh, Damir now made, made a sort of uh, fast mock-up, and so it's not, not, not uh, live yet. Uh, but if we conclude uh, maybe together that that could be a way forward, then uh, we would appreciate them uh, to try and re implement it. Yes, you want to say something? No? Okay. Somebody else who wanted to say something else? Otherwise, um, what I wanted to do is, is, I just wanted to point out one thing, is that the two topics were there were also a little bit on purpose in the sense that they are linked to one another. And so, uh, often in a lot of processes, when you start talking about diplomacy, and it's about big and small problems, but what Saki has also tried to, to stress as well, it's also about uh, coming up with new ideas and new innovations uh, because uh, we also do think that uh, you need to look at the problems in a different way. Uh, so that's also where uh, the story from Damir comes in. And those innovations are not only on the technical level, but they're also on, on the social and economic level. So it's also about how you can better uh, say, engage with one another, understand one another's problems, so it's a bit on the social side. But also maybe on the economic side, uh, where water and energy is often exchangeable. And so can you create goods to be exchanged? So there are a lot of different components in there, but they are related to one another. So that's the only thing I wanted to add. And then before you go for coffee, uh, after the coffee break, which uh, takes until uh, 4 o'clock, so you have half an hour also to discuss a little bit, 
Uh, we come back in two rooms, and uh, if correct, on your bench, uh, under your name, you will find the room where you expect it uh, to, to go to. And, yeah, sorry, room A2 and A3. And uh, also, uh, you can be assured uh, that you stay in that room then, but you will get two sessions in the room itself. Because the presenters will change the room, so that will make it slightly easier for you. You don't have to move everybody, and you can just stay here, but you will be uh, sitting in the two sessions. So with that, uh, I would like to thank the presenters, actually, of uh, the beginning of uh, the session, and invite you for uh, tea or coffee. So thank you very much.